You can use it. I don't need it. Okay. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and get us started. Uh, thank you for uh, being here today uh, and taking time off off, off work. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Justice Willett from the Texas Supreme Court is speaking down the road over in Birmingham uh, right now at lunch, and we'll be speaking again uh, at an Alabama Policy Institute dinner this evening. Um, I want to thank Judge McFadden for being here and Justice Brown for being here today. And uh, as a housekeeping announcement, I wanted to make sure everyone was aware that the National Lawyers Convention is Thursday, November 17th through Saturday, November 19th. So if you're considering registering for that, please talk to me and maybe we can arrange uh, an Alabama constituency to appear at that. Uh, I want to start us off a little differently today uh, by reading a quote from Alexis de Tocqueville. And uh, without revealing why, I'll just, I'll just read the quotes. The quote is this. The political associations that exist in the United States are only a single feature in the midst of the immense, immense assemblage of associations in that country. Americans of all ages, all conditions, and all dispositions constantly form associations. They have not only the mainstream manufacturing of which all take part, but associations with thousands of other houses, religious, moral, serious, futile, general or restricted, enormous or diminutive. The Americans make associations to give entertainments, to found seminaries, to build inns, to construct churches, to diffuse books, to send missionaries to the Antipodes. In this manner, they found hospitals, prisons, and schools. If it is proposed to inculcate some truth or to foster some feeling by the encouragement of a great example, they form a society. Wherever at the head of some new undertaking you see the government in France or a man of rank in England, in the United States, you will be sure to find an association. So why do I read that quote to lead us off today? Well, first of all, it's because you know, we've been going on here now for over three years. And I see our group, the Montgomery Federal Society, as uh, part of the continuity of that, of that tradition of American associational life. Uh, for Mr. Tocqueville, American associations uh, and mediating institutions with bulwarks against tyranny, uh, because an isolated individual couldn't, um, couldn't face the threat of a, of a commanding, powerful state by himself or by herself. Uh, only like-minded persons organized into communities of purpose could resist illegitimate, illegitimate power and wrest control of the hearts and minds of the people. So what we do here every month may seem, you know, it may seem routine, it may seem like habit, it may just seem like a, a fun networking thing, but I think what we're doing in the big picture is actually pretty important over the long run as we cultivate friendships and we cultivate an association based on good ideas and constructive political and legal discourse. So um, I want to thank everyone here for coming and uh, for continuing to come over the last few years. It's my privilege today to introduce Professor Josh Blackman from Houston College of Law. Josh and I have known each other since 2009. I was an adjunct legal associate at the, at the Cato Institute at the time, and Josh was uh, a federal judge at the time, and uh, I helped him and our friend Ilya Shapiro at the Cato Institute work on a, a law review article. And uh, funny enough, we have never actually met in person until this year. And this is actually the third time we've seen each other in this person month. this month. <laughs> uh, a few weeks ago, we were together at the Philadelphia Society. After that, we went to a Federal Society of Liberty Fund. These associations, man, they get together. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> the Associational Life of Americans. That's right. So uh, it's, it's really an honor to finally uh, meet Josh and to hang out with him. My first, first time in Montgomery. Very happy. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll get to that. I'll get to that later. We can talk about that afterwards. Um, Josh is an associate professor of law at the Houston College of Law. He specializes in uh, constitutional law, the U.S. Supreme Court, and the intersection of law and technology. He's the author of the critically uh, acclaimed Unprecedented, the Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare, and his new book, which is forthcoming with Cambridge University Press, already out. You can buy a copy. It's already out. It's up here on the um, on the slide. 
is Unraveling Obamacare, Religious Liberty, and Executive Power. Uh, Professor Blackman was selected by Forbes for the 30 under 30 in law and policy and has twice testified before the House Judiciary Committee, an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, and he founded the Harlan Institute. Uh, he's the director of judicial research at Lex Predict and has offered over three dozen law review articles and probably many more for to come. He is extremely prolific. Uh, his commentary has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the USA Today, the LA Times. And elsewhere, so please join me in welcoming Josh to our little association. My first time Montgomery, my third time seeing Alan this month, and we've been talking for about eight years, and I'm glad to finally have had a chance to meet you in person. Uh, you're in for a treat today, my friends. I'll be talking about a new book. The title is Unraveled, Obamacare, Religious Liberty, and Executive Power. And this book tells the story of Obamacare uh, from the beginning until the soon to be end, I guess you could say. Um, and our story actually begins, ah, I need to plug my little USB thing into get, uh, my, my, my uh, navigation. Haha, there we go. Our story actually begins long before the ACA was ever a glimmer in Barack Obama's eyes. It began in the 1990s with Hillary Care, I see people shaking their heads already, I know I'm in Alabama, for sure. Um, you may recall that in 1993, uh, First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton, she was still Rodham back then, um, proposed a national health care system called the Health Security Act, and it would give every American a little card that gives them the power of having a health insurance from the government or from other sources. Now, at first, people didn't know quite what to make of this. But very soon, the unpopularity of this law became clear through a series of commercials. So who here remembers these commercials? And remember them? The Harry and Louise commercials? Yeah. So you should I give this talk on college campuses by since we're even born yet. You have no excuse not remembering because you were all alive in 1993. I think so, at least. The health insurance lobby aired a series of commercials where you had this mom, pop, Harry and Louise. <clears throat> and they were sitting at a table looking at this voluminous health care plan and saying, you know, uh, uh, I don't want government to control health care. I like my doctor. I want to keep my doctor. I like my insurance. I want to keep my insurance. I don't want some bureaucrat getting between me and my health. These commercials were so effective that within the span of one year, the popularity of Hillary Care nosedived. So unsurprisingly, Hillary Care failed, and in 1994, the GOP took the House, largely on the back of the unpopularity of this health care reform. And this more or less started the modern-day conservative control of the House of Representatives. You see, there's an important truth that was learned from the Hillary Care experience. If you want to propose health care reform, you have to make people think they can keep what they have. Ah, nice, you have a so there's a basic principle of economics that I'd like to explain to you. There are three aspects of health insurance. It's cost, how comprehensive it is, and how accessible, that is how many people can gain access to it. There are three factors. I'll give you two of them at any one time. If you want healthcare to be cheap, it's not gonna be very comprehensive. If you want it to be comprehensive, it's not going to be cheap. And if you want health care to be available for everyone, it's going to be real expensive and not good for most people. This is an inescapable aspect of economics. So about the Tocqueville, we talk about Adam Smith, right? You cannot make supply and demand disappear because health care is important. When you make something available for more people, the cost goes up. Simple as that. So how was the Affordable Care Act sold? Well, the Obama administration learned the lessons from Hillary Care's defeat. And they recognized that they told people, yeah, you know what? We need to cover another 30 million new people, so we're going to have to cancel your coverage and make it more expensive. <coughs> Not exactly the best marketing plan. So instead, <coughs> what did President Obama tell people to ensure the passage of the ACA? You know what to say. It was a promise told nearly three dozen times. If you like your plan, you can keep your plan. Now, this was a lot, plain and simple, right? We're not even going to argue about that. 
But this was a pernicious lie. The reason why the lie was pernicious was because it created a mentality that exists to this day that we can simultaneously have health care reform and not change the status quo. It's impossible. You cannot have both. If you want to expand health insurance to 30 million more people, that money's got to come from somewhere. And if you want to make people have cheaper care, that's going to take away from someone else. Which is why Obamacare was built on a series of lies from top to bottom <clears throat> that only now, years later, we're beginning to recognize how profound those myths and truths were. But no matter. If you go back to 2009, when the AC was being debated in Congress, no one knew about this. Well, maybe people did, but it was quiet. But every politician from Harry Reid on down uh, insisted that this would be an awesome law. It would not change whatever we had. All it would do would be to give health insurance to new people. Impossible. Now, the ECA was released in the Senate in December of 2009. The bill was nearly 3,000 pages. No one actually read the bill. Uh, uh, that's not important anymore. Indeed, Senator Max Baucus, who was the chairman of the Finance Committee, <laughs> bragged, saying, I don't read bills. I don't have the time for that. I pay people to read the bills for me. Wonderful. So in December 24, 2009, on Christmas Eve, the Senate voted on a version of the ECA that is best characterized as a draft. It wasn't meant to be the final version, because here was the plan. We'll pass the version of the Senate, the House will pass their version, and they'll have a conference committee go back and forth, shuttling, figuring out what to change, what to fix. The idea was, let the Senate vote on Christmas Eve, lock in the votes of all the Democrat senators, they don't get weak need when they go back to the districts for Christmas, uh, uh, and that way we'll have a certainty of how strong uh, uh, support for this law is. But then something crazy happened. After that December 24th vote, the composition of the Senate was altered. The, Senate, the summer before, Senator Ted Kennedy of Massachusetts had passed away. He was, if you recall, the 60th vote in the Senate for the Democrats. Kennedy was replaced by Scott Brown, a Republican, a Republican Tea Party, indeed, who ran on the platform of trying to stop Obamacare. With Scott Brown's victory, the entire dynamics changed. Why? The Senate no longer had 60 Democrats. They had 59. And if the House tried to send the bill back to the Senate for this you know, conference process, filibuster, dead, done. Obama could be no more. So what happened? The Democrats, Nancy Pelosi, said, well, we'll pass the bill to find out what's in it. And she meant that sincerely. They were not able to make the changes to the law that they had intended to. They had one plan, one plan only. Pass the Senate bill and worry about it later. And that's exactly what they did. The Democrats passed this draft version of the bill, which had a lot of things that were never meant to be final, because that was their only way of beating a filibuster. So the law we have now, this 3,000-page monstrosity, was never even meant to be the final law. It was a draft. Can you imagine transforming 10% of the U.S. economy on a whim because they couldn't get the law filibuster? But that was a decision President Obama made, and it passed the House on a straight party-line vote. This was March 22nd, 2010, and I'll draw your attention to this little duplicate that I can make zero. Uh, that, that zero right there, um, not a single Republican supported this law. Um, and to this day, the Republican Party is intent on repealing and replacing Obamacare with what? Different, different lecture. But they're intent because they want nothing to do with this law. The reason why this is significant is because Republicans have no interest in making this work. In fact, they're intent on seeing it fail and unravel. The decision to go this alone and seek no bipartisan buy-in was frankly unprecedented. In the 20th century, every major piece of legislation was bipartisan. Social Security, Civil Rights Act, American Disabilities, Medicare, Medicaid, go down the list, they all have bipartisan buy-in. Obamacare, zero. Now maybe you'll say, we'll blame this on Republicans for being intransigent. It doesn't really matter the reason why. The fact is, it passed that way, and now half the country wants a lot to disappear. And the other half is scrambling and saying, oh, man, this is not working as we planned it to work. No matter. March 23rd, 2010, they'll never forget, 
uh, under the signing ceremony at the White House, and President Obama proudly signed Obamacare into law. And you can smile and be man, I did this. People are going to love me for this. This is going to be the greatest thing ever. Not quite. Within seven minutes, seven minutes of Obamacare being signed into law, a series of constitutional challenges were filed across the country. The first by the Attorney General of Florida, uh, not too far from here, uh, in Pensacola. Uh, uh, another suit filed by the Attorney General of Virginia, challenging Obamacare's individual mandate. The argument was Obamacare makes people buy health care insurance, right? Can the government make you buy a commercial product? Right. If you're interested in spending another $15, my first book was called Unprecedented, the Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare. Um, and as we all know, can the government make you buy broccoli? Well, no, but they can tax you if you don't. Uh, the outcome of the decision, Anthony Sibelius, was Supreme Court, per Chief Justice Roberts, held that Obamacare didn't actually make you buy insurance. We'll simply pretend that it taxes the uninsured, and that was a valid exercise of its commerce power, even if it wasn't a valid exercise of its, sorry, valid exercise of its taxing power, even if it was not a valid exercise of its commerce power. Uh, the chief did his little jujitsu of <laughs> the Constitution. Um, you know, every time I teach that case with my students, I keep reading, hoping it turns out differently, and it never does. It always turns out the same way, and it breaks my heart every time I get to the end. I'm like, no, not again. But that's what happened. After the court's decision, NFPB Sibelius, it turns to the political process to perhaps stop Obamacare. Uh, uh, Governor Mitt Romney was our candidate a couple years ago, um, and he was quite possibly the worst conceivable candidate for the time until this year. Uh, <laughs> no tomatoes, please. The reason why was that Romney had basically invented Obamacare. As Governor of Massachusetts, he instituted Romney Care which had very similar features to Obamacare, and the same people designing it, John and Gruber, among others. So during the debate, President Obama goes to Romney, you are the godfather of Obamacare. You want to know what? He was right. And so Romney didn't have much of a chance. He lost. President Obama was inaugurated for a second term. You can imagine being the chief for saying, years. like, thanks, buddy. Uh, uh, but th this, was, this was the end of the first saga. The next chapter I'd like to talk about involves religious liberty, a topic which Alan sent through about later, uh, focus on strongly what I call conscience and contraception. During the debates over the ACA, the biggest uh, controversy involved funding of abortion. Would Obamacare fund abortion with government taxpayer dollars? Um, Bart Supak, who's a pro-life Democrat from Michigan, um, insisted that he would not support Obamacare unless there was uh, sufficient protection for the unborn. Uh, 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 without this, you know, this pro-life Democratic caucus, the ACA would be dead in the water. Uh, uh, President Obama, to assuage this, signed an executive order promising not to alter any long-standing funding, uh, uh, funding provisions on abortion. Now, as you all know, an executive order is worthless. That's why should be this executive order, uh, because it had no actual teeth and in no way affected the law. So these uh, pro-life Democrats were bought off based on you know, smoking mirrors, and they. Uh, they supported the law. But the actual funding of abortion turned out to not be the big religious liberty debate. Indeed, the big debate concerned what was called the Women's Health Amendment. This was from Senator Mikulski of Maryland. Now, I'm going to blow your mind right now. You've all heard about Hobby Lobby, right? You've heard about Little Sisters of the Poor. The ACA does not have a contraception mandate. The bill that Congress actually voted on doesn't even have the words contraceptives or birth control in it. All the EC has is this woman's health amendment that says for women, insurers must provide, quote, <coughs> preventive care. Preventive care. What is preventive care? Well, if you ask me, I think you look at mammogram, you know, colonoscopy, things that prevent disease. Ah, you're thinking too poorly. <coughs> HHS and the HRSA and the Institute of Medicine, in their infinite wisdom, said the term preventive care is ambiguous. So under the Chevron Doctrine, we will interpret it to mean the full range of FDA-approved contraceptives, including the morning-after pill, that's Plan B, and L. So what's being prevented is actually fertilization. That's how preventive care was being read. Um, indeed, in the legislative history, the word preventive care appears nowhere. There are a couple of references to family planning, which are very careful. Place, but they do not in any way mention birth control. What does this mean? 
Well, I guess for uh, women, this is this is wonderful. This was actually a real commercial uh, put out by the Colorado Healthcare Administration. And I'm going to read this if you can't read it. Right now. So if I get in trouble, Alabama, I'm not, I'm not, you know, a lawyer. Uh, it says, uh, uh, "Let's get physical." OMG, he's hot. Let's hope he's as easy to get as his birth control. So now there's this new entitlement that says women, as a matter of right, have to get birth control from their employer. But who's paying for this? The ACA does not contain any exemptions whatsoever for religious employers. It applies to any employer with more than 50 workers, including the proverbial bus full of nuns. Yes, the little sisters of the poor are a nationwide group of many employees. And under that statute, they would be compelled to pay for birth control for their employees. You can imagine this didn't go over too well. Uh, uh, there was a lot of controversy over this. Um, uh, so there were several rounds of accommodations, and I want to discuss these. The very first regulation announced by the Obama administration said, only houses of worship are exempt from this mandate, and only if they primarily serve people of their own faith. So if you're at church, and you operate a soup kitchen, and you don't check baptismal certificates at the door, you are not religious enough for the first exemption. If you operate a hypothermia shelter at a church in the winter, you don't have that permit yet, but they have it, right? You would not be exempted. <clears throat> You would have to then pay for your employees morning after those. This was very controversial. And eventually the Obama administration said, uh-oh, uh, okay, let, let, let's try this again. So the second round of regulation said, okay, all houses of worship are exempted, right? Even if you, you know, open your doors to the community and perhaps welcome other people, you are exempted. But what about religious charities like the Little Sisters of the Poor? So this is an important distinction, and follow this one. Houses of worships were exempted. Religious charities were accommodated. What does it mean to accommodate them? Well, their employees will still be getting birth control, but the little sisters won't have to pay for it. Instead, the insurance company pays for it. But here's the key part. The birth control is provided through the charity's insurance plan. As a conduit to get these women birth control, you use the Little Sisters plan. This is what they call hijacking, that they are hijacking our plan and making us pay for it through the auspices of their contract. The government said, well, too bad, you're not paying for it, so you're not burdened. This gave rise to a lot of litigation, which began <clears throat> with Hobby Law. Okay. But let's get it right. Obamacare is not only about legal battles, it's also about political battles. And I want to talk about the period of the summer and the fall of 2013, which was a very um, chaotic time in Obamacare's history. So if you had asked me, after Mitt Romney was defeated, is the battle of Obamacare over? I would have said, yeah. And in fact, in my first book, I concluded it with saying, well, now that Romney lost the election, Obamacare is settled and basically everything's done. Boy, was I wrong. And every day I see how wrong I was. So maybe don't listen to me. Wrong. I have very bad predictions, so don't listen to my predictions. Because during the summer of 2013, my junior senator and a federal side member of good standing, uh, Ted Cruz, uh, was on cable news with commercials every five seconds. Remember these? Call your senator. Tell them to defund Obamacare. And Cruz uh, uh, and Senator Mike Lee of Utah toured the country urging people to contact the members of Congress and tell them to defund Obama. So here was the plan. This was a coincidence of cosmic proportions. The budget that funded the U.S. government expired on September 30, 2013. Obamacare exchanges opened on October 1, 2013. So funding stopped on September 30th. Obamacare opened October 1st. So the plan was Let's not pass a new budget if it funds Obamacare so we can stop it before it starts. Everyone get the plan. That may sound intuitive until you realize that Obamacare cannot be defunded. When Congress enacted Obamacare, they put it under what's called a permanent appropriation. 
In other words, it does not depend on a new annual appropriation of Congress every year. It exists in perpetuity. The only way to defund Obamacare is to repeal the damn law in its entirety. You can't get rid of it. It's like cockroaches and Pete Richards. It will be here forever. <laughs> so Cruz's strategy, although perhaps good at riling up the base and maybe laying the groundwork for his future presidential campaign, uh, uh, had no chance of success. Even if President Obama signed his budget, Obamacare would continue on a um, That didn't stop what happened next. Um, so Senator Ted Cruz, to draw attention to this, decided to filibuster on the Senate floor. Now, it wasn't actually a filibuster. This is an important point to stress. A vote was scheduled for the next day at noon. When a vote's scheduled, that's your heart stop. You cannot go beyond that time. So it wasn't actually a filibuster, but man, was he up there for a 24 hours speaking straight. Um, I'm tired of speaking for an hour. I can't imagine going up there for 24 hours straight. In fact, at, at nighttime, he actually had his children Green Eggs and Ham, Dr. Seuss, a bedtime story. Uh, it was pretty, pretty creative. And you see, here he was the first night, and the second is a little bit haggard, his ties down, his collar's wrinkled. And if you look carefully, he's wearing a come and take it pin. Kind of, you know, Texas, the battle flag of Gonzales. If you don't come afterwards, I'll have to talk about it with you. Uh, Cruz emerged victorious, and this galvanized House Republicans say, you know, we are not going to pass a budget that funds Obamacare. Even though Obamacare was funded anyway, uh, this is why you know you get your mail during shutdown, you get your Medicare checks. Obamacare would continue on. So what happened about a week after Cruz's filibuster or asterisk, uh, uh, the money ran out, and President Obama was all too happy to say, "Okay, we got a government shutdown, and we will shut down the national parks." <laughs> the most visible symbol of this was the World War II memorial in Washington D.C. Uh, you have this group called Honor Flight that brings veterans of World War II to D.C. to see the memorial. And you can imagine you these vets who plan these trips months in advance, and they show up in D.C., and you have these barricades blocking the entrance. Um, you know, the beaches of Normandy didn't stop them, so some stupid barricades were not going to stop these <laughs> vets either. So they came, they picked up these barricades, and they literally dropped them on the White House lawn uh, across the street. Yeah, right? And they went into this open-air memorial. It wasn't like a park. Um, I, I'm going to digress briefly, but if you ever want to fix the budget, one of the first things you have to do is make sure during a shutdown, parks are funded. If you have a government shutdown, it's a misnomer. Most of the government stays open. You get your mail, you get your Medicare checks, you get your Social Security. Only discretionary employees are furloughed, and they eventually get their salaries back. Right? But the parks where people see, the museums are shut down. This is, this is insane. Mount Rushmore was shut down. How do you shut down a mountain? I don't know how that works. There was actually a highway overlook <laughs> that you could park your car and look at the mountain from a distance. They closed that off. They put, a, they put cones there. The Grand Canyon. It's a hole. They shut down the hole. I don't, I don't know how this works. My favorite, though, is that they shut down Ellis Island, the Statue of Liberty, but the governor of New York worked at a deal to fund it out of state money to keep it open. So. Make of that what you will. Uh, the governor of Arizona, Jim Brewer, said we'll pay to keep open the Grand Canyon. No deal. But after a few weeks of this government shutdown, Republicans took a massive hit. And eventually they caved. And the reason why they caved was because of the debt ceiling. See, it wasn't enough to get a government shutdown. We simultaneously had the situation where the government debt limit was about to hit. And if we hit that limit, then things would have been bad. Uh, so the Republicans caved, they fully funded the government, and not only did they fully fund the government, they got rid of sequestration, which basically said, we'll take a penny, I'm sorry, a dime every dollar spent, uh, we'll cut the budget, that went away. This was a complete disaster for Republicans, they gained nothing at all. And Obamacare, while all the attention was on the shutdown, Obamacare was unraveling in the form of the website healthcare.gov. Um, this website, I'm not joking, costs two billion with a B. Two billion dollars to build a website that did not work at all. So as people were distracted by this government shutdown, healthcare.gov was not going very well. <laughs> Indeed, it became something of a nightmare because no one could log on and buy a policy. For, for hours and days at a time, the website was simply inaccessible. 
People did not know what they were going to do. So they were saying we were waiting forever. So what did the president do? He sent in the nerds. Uh, the so-called tech surge was brought in. These engineers from Facebook and Google who were trying to salvage this website. Now, you know you're in trouble when your strategy is named after our Iraq strategy, the tech surge. Uh, but, but fortunately for the president, uh, uh, he was very cautious. And eventually, it turned out that it worked well enough. Uh, people were able to log onto the website and search for policies. But the next major crisis was also unfolding in this same chaotic time period, which were the cancellations. Now, we'll talk about this earlier, right? The president's promise that you can keep a plan if you like it was impossible to keep. Why? Obamacare said if you have these old, thrifty, cheap plans that cover you know, catastrophes, that plan is no longer valid. We want everyone to be paying into these very generous plans to subsidize these millions of new people who are poor and sick. Obamacare is the reason why plans were canceled, because they said your old plans are no longer good enough to get something new. Uh, the president insisted that, well, these plans being canceled, it's not Obamacare's fault, it's your insurance company's fault. Give me a break. The reason why they're canceling it, and the lie of the year was indeed true, um, is because the Obamacare regulations say you can't have this policy. And to this day, even last week, it makes me furious. The president gave a speech, he said, you know, if your policy is going up and this is happening, it's not because of Obamacare, blame your insurance company. Give me a uh, I, I had a piece in the Hill yesterday saying Barack Obama's still in denial. He is in denial, serious denial. Yet, eventually the website turned on, people went to the local Obamacare store. I don't know where this place is, but I, but, but I guess they have an Obamacare store somewhere. I you get to go buy Obamacare, I don't know. Um, and, and eventually they announced in the spring of 2014 that 8 million people signed up. Now, you have to look at these numbers with a serious grain of salt. First, this kind of people registered and signed up. That's not how people actually paid their bills. So what we're seeing with Obamacare is that people are very strategic. They sign up for health insurance, they get treatment, surgery, chemotherapy, whatever, and they cancel their coverage. And then they never pay their bills. And they stick all of you with their bills. This is happening in large numbers. So of this 8 million people, maybe actually 7 million actually paid their bill. And of these 8 million, probably about half of them had their policies canceled and were required to buy new insurance and perhaps they didn't So these numbers are inflated in a very disingenuous way to this day. The government predicted that in 2016, there would be 20 million people who signed up on Obamacare. 20 million. Do you know the actual number? 10. They're only halfway there of what they expected. You wonder why these insurance companies are fleeing because they're not making any money because no one's signing up for these products that are not only subsidized, but mandated, right? The government makes you buy a product, penalizes if you don't buy it, and it gives you subsidies, and they still can't get people to sign up. It's just not a good value for them. <coughs> It's not worth it. You spend so much on your premium, your deductible is so high, that you're simply losing money. And people, this is the New York Times yesterday, are making the conscious choice of paying the penalty and saving your money rather than going into this Obamacare market. This is Let's go back to the law and give you enough politics. And let's talk about religious liberty. To understand the plight of Hobby Lobby and the Muslims of the poor, we have to discuss the case of Al Smith. Al Smith was a Native American who lived in Oregon. And as part of his religious rituals, he used peyote. You guys know what this is? It's like this hallucinogenic cactus. If you ever use it, don't tell me. <laughs> Oddly enough, Al Smith's appointment was a drug counselor, right? He counseled a drug addict. Uh, unsurprisingly, his boss wasn't too happy about this, and he was fired. Smith went to collect unemployment benefits from the state, and they denied his benefits, saying, look, you were fired for breaking the law, you were using a controlled substance, uh, uh, we're not giving you benefits. The case went to the Supreme Court, in a very controversial opinion by Justice Scalia, the court said, wait a minute, this is fine, right? This is a law that applies generally, it doesn't target Native Americans, or this religion, or that religion, it's a law of general applicability, it does not violate the free exercise clause. Congress did not like this decision, and they attempted through statute to overturn it in the form of RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Um, this was a bipartisan bill of amazing stat, uh, uh, amazing uh, gravity, right? You have Chuck Schumer and Orrin Hatch sponsoring this bill, much younger Chuck Schumer and Orrin Hatch. Uh, it passed almost, I think, virtually unanimously in the House. In the Senate, and President Clinton signed it very quickly. 
So what did the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or RIFRA, do? It says if the government wants to substantially burden religion, they have to do so with the least restrictive means, right? So if there's one way of doing it that burns religion, and another way of doing it that burns religion less, they have to do it in the least restrictive method possible to achieve their compelling interest. Uh, the Supreme Court wasn't too fond of this law, and they said, well, as applied to the states, it's unconstitutional, right? Congress can uh, redefine the First Amendment, uh, and they can't allow the states to be sued and uh, abrogate sovereign immunity. But RIFRA still applies to the federal government. And Hobby Lobby used it to challenge the constitutionality of the second law, to challenge the legality of this mandate to buy contraceptives. Um, Hobby Lobby, as I'm sure you know, is a business, and they sell crafts. It started off in David Green's garage, where he made picture frames. Uh, he opened a store, and <laughs> they have in nearly 400 stores nationwide. Um, but Hobby Lobby is not a publicly traded company. Uh, it's a closely held business. It's owned by a husband and wife. And this may look like an Easter card, uh, but in fact, it's actually a photograph of the board of directors. All the directors of the company are family members. Uh, uh, they have the same beliefs, they have the same religion, they share the same values. And as a whole, the company believes that providing four forms of birth control, including morning after pill and LF Plan B, uh, are sinful. And they do not want to be subject to this mandate. Now, I'm going to pause here for a minute. Um, if you're a publicly traded company like Chevron or you know GE, you're not going to have enough consensus on your board to say we can't have birth control in plan, right? Because you're so many different people. When your board of directors is about 15 or 20 family members with the same religious values, you get there pretty quickly. So it's very significant that this, even though it's a big company, it's held in a very narrow trust format that, that is uh, a, a strikingly unique in today's society. So Hobby Lobby sought to get an exemption from the uh, contraceptive mandate under the Religious Freedom Restoration. In this case, went to the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, one of my favorite pastimes is, is looking at signs outside the Supreme Court, because I think it really captures the dynamics of what people think of the law. So this was my favorite. If men can get pregnant, there should be a comma there, birth control will be from gumbo machines and be bacon flavored. Uh, uh, this is a craft store, not a church. This is a healthcare plan, not the Holy Bible. Uh, 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 this woman's actually dressed like a pack of birth control pills. Those are not m and uh, uh, No bosses in my bedroom. Pop them up. I agree with this. They don't want to fund this one. Better. I think these signs are a little bit misguided. Uh, Contraceptive is my business. Uh, corporations are not people. Uh, she's my favorite. She crocheted a uterus. <laughs> there was actually a campaign. Which I'm, I'm positive she did not buy her yarn at Hobby Lobby. Uh, there was actually a campaign <laughs> to mail crocheted uteruses to the president of Hobby Lobby saying, mess with this one, not mine. I'll leave it there. Uh, keep your hands off my hobbies off my ovaries. Uh, uh, there's some pro-life people. I ain't pro-life. These guys, uh, they need to get better signs. They were saying they're in the middle of a snowstorm wearing kilts in a bagpipe, saying God's love comes first, repeal socialist Obama. <laughs> the case was argued by uh, Paul Clement for the challengers and Don Brilliant for the government. Uh, 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 and uh, much to the surprise of many, uh, Hobby Lobby was actually victorious. They, they won the case. Um, Justice Alito held that even though you're a corporation, you can have religious exercise. And the government, if you know, if contraceptive is so important, they can pay for it themselves. They don't need to make this corporation pay for it. Let the government pay for it. Let someone else pay for it. Okay? Justice Ginsburg, in her diva moment, dissented and warned that uh, the notorious RBG, as she's called, that we are walking into a minefield. Uh, 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 and that this is a, a very dangerous precedent. Um, uh, since Hobby Lobby, there have not been many instances where corporations have sought uh, religious exemptions to the law, but this was, you know, a, a cost celeb on the left. And for a very rare case, the pro life community actually won a case. It doesn't happen that often anymore. It won't happen for a long time in the future either. Um, let's move on to the next case, which is called King v. Burwell. The ACA has two types of exchanges, state exchanges and federal exchanges. We grabbed the one, right? You catch that one? Oh, yeah, right. Okay, I, I'll get you guys to grab one, don't worry. The ACA has two types of exchanges, state exchanges and federal exchanges. Uh, uh, states can't be required to set exchanges. Uh, uh, and if they don't, there's a fallback federal exchange, just how cooperative federal 
works. But there's a provision of the ACA that says if you want to get subsidies for your policies, like to make your policies more affordable, you have to enroll through an exchange established by the state. Okay. Now, if you were to simply read that language, you get subsidies to enroll in a plan established by the state, you would think, okay, state exchanges get subsidies, federal exchanges do not. But that would have been too dangerous for the Obama administration because half the states did not build exchanges. So they issued a rule saying we will treat state exchanges equal to federal exchanges, notwithstanding that text. This case went to the Supreme Court in a case called Halbig uh, and then King F. Burwell. And the Supreme Court was asked, can you read the word state to mean federal? The Supreme Court, in another decision, I'll go through a few slides quickly, ruled, yeah, they can. The Chief Justice, in a decision, King v. Burwell said, the purpose of the healthcare law is to improve health insurance and not destroy it, and we will read the statute in such a way to promote health care. Justice Scalia, in what will be his last dissent delivered from the bench, said no. Court, he says, applied a special set of rules to the Affordable Care Act, which is that called Obamacare, he called SCOTUS Care. That the court goes out of its way to save this law for reasons that I will never understand. Uh, uh, but the, the Justice Blue was not happy. In my remaining two minutes, I was about the last case in the trilogy, the Little Sisters of the Poor. These are a group of nuns who help care for the elderly. Uh, I was actually fortunate enough to go to a luncheon after the case was argued. I was in this room full of nuns. It felt like a classic for sound of music, uh, uh, but it was, it was a very, very powerful event. Uh, and these nuns are amazing people. And all they're asking for is very simple. If giving women insurance and contraceptive is so important, government should pay for it themselves. Do not use our plan. Go give these women a separate plan, do a separate card for dental or a prescription drug, use a separate plan. So this case goes to the Supreme Court. It's argued. And I was there, I was actually sworn to the Supreme Court bar that morning. And I'll tell you, it looked really close. The justice seemed really conflicted. How can you rule on this case when the nuns came out, they were victorious, they thought, well, maybe, maybe we won. Um, and then something crazy happened. The court assigned the parties some homework, the judge assigned homework. They asked for additional briefings. They said, well, you've given us this you know, proposal, that's not going to work. Is there some other way that the nuns can get women birth control that doesn't violate the religious liberty? Give us anything, whatever you got, right? And the party said, well, maybe we could do this, and maybe we could do that, but there's a big disagreement. And the disagreement is this. The nuns say, we will not allow contraceptives to be sold over our plan. The government says, contraceptive has to be sold on the same plan, because making women sign for a separate policy is burdensome. It's a burden. So again, nuns, different plan. Government, same plan. Those are really different positions. What did the Supreme Court do? They ignored it. They said, well, the party said they can have a compromise. Remand to the lower courts. You guys figure it out. And that's actually where the case stands today. They remanded it, I think, to five or six lower courts. And now they have to figure out the first instance. Is this other proposal, which was never before mentioned by the government, possible to resolve the religious doubts? I don't think so. Or maybe I'll have none of it, as the sign says. So where do we find ourselves today? Well, we're on the dawn of an election with 11 or 12 days, so this insanity is over. I hope my parade's almost over. Um, uh, and the likely scenario is the next president will have to be confronted with this unraveling law. Um, this law is not long for this world. Uh, it may be called Obamacare in name, but its substance is on the rocks. And the reason why is that the economics are not working. The plan was, let's get all these young health people to enroll and they can subsidize these old sicker people. That is not happening. The penalty is not high enough to make people buy insurance, and the subsidies are not high enough to defray the cost. And even if you get a policy, the deductibles are high, co-pays are high, networks are small, and people are finding this is not a valuable thing. Uh, whoever the next president is, going to have a serious problem on his or her hand dealing with this. And if you want to see the title of my third book, the first one was unprecedented, the second one was unraveled. The trilogy will be. Thank you so much, and I welcome your questions. Uh, listen to the radio.
game this morning, they were saying which changes are about to open up again. And they simultaneously said they're hoping they'll be a lot more people sign up. And the premiums were going up 22%. I thought there was a conflict there. Although they didn't emphasize, I thought this was funny. But that's <laughs> average. Some people will go up less. And I thought, well, that's the flip side of that. <laughs> but at any rate, um, do you think that that's a, a spiral where the premiums go up, less people participate? Or do you think they can reach some sort of stability where some significant number of people will just pay these premiums and you move to a more stable market one goes up 7% a year? Um, so thank you for the question. Um, the short answer is, by most estimates, the enrollment is looking at plateau this year. They're not going to gain many more people. Most people who want insurance have already acquired it. And what you're actually seeing is people dropping their coverage. Um, one bit you often hear on the radio as well, even though the prices go up, people get subsidies, so they don't see the actual cost. And this number is 85% of the people on the Obamacare exchanges get subsidies. Well, such for those 15 people, 50% who don't, but the number is even more misleading. If you are a family of four who makes more than $90,000 a year, you get zero subsidies. For you, this makes no sense to go into the market. You go to a private insurance broker. So nearly half the people who buy insurance, not for the employer, but privately, get zero subsidies. So this entire business about 85% gain subsidies is misleading. A lot of people who make $90,000 a year family for it, it's not, it's not a lot, right, are going to be totally screwed. And they're not going to be able to buy anything out of Obama there. And you're see the number is even dropping who's covered. It's even conceivable that the insurance rate actually goes down in the next year or two. It's actually conceivable. Yes, sir. What about the subsidy? How, how is it uh, uh, paid for and where is it projected? You. I mean, we say subsidies, right? These are tax credits given to insurance companies from the U.S. Treasury. Uh, it, this is not a bottomless pit. Um, one of the proposals to fix Obamacare is increase subsidies. Well, guess what? That adds to the deficit, right? This is not free money that's being, oh, maybe it's being printed, but it's not free money. It's coming from the U.S. Treasury. And the insurance companies say, yeah, give us more money. That will not actually control costs, because that's something what the free blue. Is that in the statute or in the regs? The statute permits payments of subsidies based on your adjusted income. So it's a very specific form of how much you can get. But people will gain it also. Yes, sir? I kind of want to talk to points here, or sort of rhetorical points. So if you're, oh, there's always an insurer for people, we've got to be really bad for them. So we can get insurance anywhere else. I've heard people say, well, it would have been cheaper just to pay for all the uninsurables and just sort of leave it at that. Is that, does it have any basis in reality? And is that potentially a way that, say, the Republican administration could go to say, all right, we're kind of getting rid of Obamacare, we're just going to pay for the uninsured people, we're glad everything else we can handle it. So, thank, you. thank you. So, the question discusses the uninsured. Um, there's two important things to remember. First, a lot of people are uninsured intentionally. They made the decision, it does not make sense for me to afford health insurance. I'd rather use money to buy a car or to pay for a mortgage, whatever else. There were people who were uninsurable, that is, that they were very sick and ill. And if the problem is simply covering these people, you could have done it through a tax on health insurance. Let people keep what they have, put these other people to a risk pool and subsidize them. But Obamacare's strategy was, let's put everyone in the same boat. Let's take everyone out of these really generous policies they like, with mental care. And this, I think, was the fatal conceit of the law. That instead of actually targeting the specific problem they had, they tried to put everyone to the same boat, which is really leading to the unraveling of the private insurance market. Yes, sir. I know this is based on assumption, but I, I don't think every proponent of this act is economically ignorant. They, they wanted its failure so they could go to a single payer system. That was the I get this question. I get this question every time, right? Was Obamacare designed to fail, right? My answer is not this quickly. <laughs> okay, if you look at John, I have a piece in National Review um, in a week or two ago. Obamacare is unraveling ahead of schedule. <laughs> they knew that this was not a permanent solution, right? They knew that this was a temporary solution, but they didn't think it would blow up in Obama's presence. They wanted to at least wait till the next guy or or comes into office. It's blowing up ahead of schedule. They thought it would at least last five or six years, get past 2020 maybe, maybe a couple elections, people like it. Because if it worked okay enough and then started falling apart, the person said, look, government can't do this, we need to tweak it. 
But by falling apart so early, it diminishes any faith that the government can fix it. Right? We're not even year four. We're not even year four yet of Obama here. And it's already, I mean, basically if Hillary and Bill Clinton saying this thing doesn't work, uh, I, I thought if you'd ask me in 2012, I'd say give it a decade, a full apart in a decade, to take three years. Yes, sir. <clears throat> why should healthcare be a doctor? I'm sorry? What, why should you go to see a doctor? So one of the victories of President Obama is to convince people that health care is a right. And he repeats his line, health is a right, not a privilege. That's sophistry. The government cannot give you rights. You don't have a right from the government. Some of the rights come from the government created. Um, however, people now believe this. And once you give an entitlement, you can't really take it away. So even though President Obama went down the 60-vote route, he knew once he gives out this entitlement, you can't ratchet that. There are 20 million people who now have health insurance who do not have it before. Now, most of those people are on Medicaid getting free government insurance. A lot of people have a canceled plans so they're required to buy new stuff. So the number is actually a lot smaller than 20 million. But whatever the number is, there are people who have insurance now that could not get it before. And taking it away from them is politically conscious. So um, whatever Republican professes to do, he can't touch that. You see that, right? Can't touch that. So it, it's in this weird spot where um, Obama won. Right? The second he gives away, he was victorious. Even if Obamacare implodes, it does not reverse the entitlement issue that you that you raised. That is set in stone, and as we know, right, things chiseled into stone cannot be removed. What's next then? I mean, the Republicans. I'm sorry, what's your question? How did, what's, what, say a Republican, you know, Trump wins. And, and <laughs> that's the Republicans get repealed and replaced and all that. What that's like funny. Uh, there are too many counterfactuals there. Uh, but <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll do my best to answer it, right? Um, the fact of the matter is, um, if you're actually serious about making health insurance more affordable and available, it would have to pretty much destroy our system. But it since World War II, the number one way people get insurance has been through an employer as a tax-free benefit. That is an awful idea. Insurance should not be tied to your employer because you don't really care about price then. And when you're compensating people through insurance, that means you're paying them less. Um, we don't need to have employer provided health insurance. We should be negotiating on our own. It makes the market much bigger. It makes it much bigger. There's more competition. However, the reason why we have this is because of labor unions. And labor unions say that their number one payment is through generous health insurance benefits. That's why we have this in a historical legacy. So my proposal would piss off a lot more people and say we need to get all employed by health insurance. Uh, but that, instead of canceling 4 million plans, we're canceling 200 million plans. So that would not be palatable. But so long as we're going down this road of simply lobbying Obamacare on top of an already polluted system, it does nothing to control costs. And, um, General mentioned the spiral. Um, I don't see the spiral ending, and I think at some point uh, President Clinton will likely institute some sort of a public option, which will compete with private insurance. And at that point, uh, it's a race to the bottom. Sorry, my last day, President Clinton, Alabama. Is that, is that a is that, is that a sanctionable offense? Sorry. <laughs> 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 they teach us how to eat better than that will save on healthcare costs. Get your broccoli. Get your oh, broccoli. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> okay, any, any other questions? Well, thank you all so much for your time. Thanks, everybody. Before you go, grab some flyers for the next uh, the next uh, meeting, which is December second. We're going to take November and December and merge them into one merging in light of all the holidays. Are you bring in? Well, they'll be here. They'll have Thanksgiving theme, I'm sure. Oh, who's the speaker? Oh, oh, Teresa Collette. Oh, she's good. She's good. Do we have a date for that? December 2nd. Thank you very much. I'll see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I have a question for you. Why do you think Roberts let two characters kill him? Hey, I don't know. <laughs> I, I wish I knew. I, you know, I, I want to try it. I've long since stopped trying to psychoanalyze John Roberts. I don't know what's in his heart. I don't know. I think he thought he could do that and it would be successful.